everyone. It's good to see you. We have reached about 35 attendees at the moment. We'll just wait for a few more and then we'll begin. So my intent is to wait for maybe another minute, minute and a half, and then I'll start talking. Good evening, Ahmed. Seeing your message. Um, if you guys can actually talk, uh, you know, just type on the webinar, which city are you currently uh, currently based in? Where are you at the moment? Are you all in Ahmedabad? Where are you at the moment? Not where you're from. It'll just give me a good sense. Bhopal, Dubai, Udaipur, Surat, Ahmedabad, Karnataka. Sundarnagar. Very nice. It seems like a very widespread. I thought it'll be mostly from Ahmedabad. Yes, we do have a few. Hi, good evening. Anshuman. Hey. Delhi, Kota. Very good to see. Very good to see. Chennai, LA. Hi, Ashima. Hi, Jasmine. Good evening. So we have 42 people. I think it's a good enough number for us to begin. And uh, thank you for taking out your time on Saturday evening. Uh, as the introduction said, this is supposed to be a lighthearted introduction to interaction design. So no heavy stuff. Uh, I'm not going to go through a very structured presentation, hopefully. Uh, my idea is basically to sensitize you to what interaction design really is and, you know, try and see whether if uh, it's a discipline that could interest you, right? This webinar, lighthearted introduction to interaction design is, of course, brought to you under the aegis of the by design knowledge series, which is instituted by Anant National University. And it's an interactive series of webinars where Anantyu faculty and various other design experts come and share their perspectives. So this is by, by design. I thank you to the team of by design, Ruthu, uh, the IT team at Anant University, and also with Jasmine and Avik who are supporting me in this webinar. So thank you all very much. Without further ado, I think I should uh, begin. And I'm seeing a few good evenings here. Thank you very much. Good evening to all of you. Um, Without further ado, let me just tell you why I think that um, I feel that I'm somewhat qualified to actually talk to you, somewhat qualified, not uh, academically qualified, but I think I might be a good person to tell you about interaction design. One of the reasons was or is the fact that about maybe six years ago, if you would have told me or uttered the word interaction design, I wouldn't know what it meant. Until five years ago, if you would have told me UI or UX or user experience, I didn't know what it was. I still don't know what is the difference between a Corel Draw and a Photoshop. I still don't know. Um, but why am I qualified to talk to you? Because I think that these are very small things to get past. Uh, I currently am the director of interaction design program at Anant University. I'm also the CEO of a company that is based in Goa, which is where I'm currently am, called Screenroot. Screenroot is a now 12 year old interaction design firm, uh, has worked across clients ranging from the current mobile app of ICICI Bank to the intranet for McKinsey to, um, you know, Pizza Hut, and you'll see that coming up in the presentation in a little bit. So we work with mainly large clients on uh, various interaction design projects, whether if it is, you know, a flight check-in kiosk or, you know, a smartwatch or interaction design of some other kind. So with that in mind, let me, let me just open up um, with a question, right? My question is uh, that let's say recently I wanted to visit a doctor. And the kind of doctor I wanted to visit was, I think I needed to visit a orthopedic doctor because I had you know, pain in my elbow. 
I think I needed to visit an orthopedic. I didn't know whether if I should go to my general family doctor because I think something had happened in my bone. But then someone said, hey, it may not be a bone. It may be a ligament or it may be something else. So maybe you should just see, you know, physiotherapist. So I went on to the hospital website, a very popular hospital website. And I went to the list of doctors that they have. And I went to list of specialties that they have. And then they had an institute called Bone and Joint Institute. They had their department of muscular sciences. I didn't know where to go. But let's say, for instance, I went to Bone and Joint Institute. Now there's 22 doctors there. Um, I don't know which doctor is right for me. Some of them are surgeons. Some of them seem very junior. Some of them were deeply experienced. But the only way for me to find out was take a guess because, you know, it said FRCP, FRCS, MBBS, London, US. So should I really select the doctor that is the oldest because presumably he or she will have the most experience? Or should I select the doctor who has the fanciest qualifications and one or two foreign countries mentioned in their qualifications? What should I select? Who should I select? Uh, because now I'm going to try and book an appointment. Now, let me pause there and let me ask you a question. And I want you to type in the webinar chat. In a situation like this, who would you call to troubleshoot? Would you call an architect? Would you call a fashion designer? Would you call an engineer? Who would you call in such a situation that, hey, we want to help our prospective patients be able to decide on which doctor they should consult without actually having to come to the doc you know, hospital and inquire. They should be able to make their decision based on some support on our website. So who can solve that problem for us? Any, any, you know, not everyone has to respond, but anyone has an opinion. Why don't you just type it out? A designer of what kind? A UX designer. Okay. Okay. Not, not, not a lot of people seem to have answers. A web designer. Perhaps, I don't know. Interaction designer, yes. You know, to be very honest with you, um, what is an interaction designer itself is a big debate. So hopefully we'll cover some of that as well, Aneri. Okay, so that was just a thought starter. Uh, yes, it is some form, a chemist, someone says, because they know all doctors, excellent answer. That's called lateral thinking for you. Thank you, Divyansh. Um, Koninika Datta Gupta. Sorry, I can't repeat my question. It was a long one, but hopefully you'll follow us. Uh, thanks for joining anyway. So um, I'll just uh, you know, start with a little bit of a presentation and we'll try to answer the question that I just asked right towards the end of it. Now there's 61 participants and I see one person has raised their hand, Divyanj. Okay. You've already asked your question, fine. Bear with me. I hope everyone can see the screen. Okay, so this is a jovial, lighthearted chat, an introduction to interaction design by Tanmay Modi um, as a part of biodesign knowledge series run by Anant National University as webinars. So thank you everyone again, and thanks for joining. As of last year, there was more than 3.3 crore Indian students that graduated with engineering, arts, science, or commerce degrees. Less than 1% of that formed design students. And less than 5% or less than 2.5% of that will be interaction designers this year. Right. What are the parts of design at Anant? Um, there are places that we live and work. So you have disciplines like architecture, like space design, like environmental design, how we present ourselves 
how we create sustainable fashion, how, what are the various different technologies, that's fashion design and technology. How do we communicate? There's you know, communication design and how we use products and things. That's interaction design and product design, out of which interaction design is a discipline that deals with how people interact with systems, uh, with things which you know it could be ranging from machines to cars to aeroplanes to laptops um, and things like that we'll dive into it a little bit deeper but this is roughly where interaction design sits now what is the difference between architecture or fashion design or communication design and interaction design what's the difference um, i know all of you roughly know the difference but I'll, let me answer that question myself. If you consider architecture or fashion design, these were disciplines that used to exist even 100 years ago. These were disciplines that used to exist even 200 years ago and even 300 years ago. You will see all the brilliant architecture, the monuments, the temples, the various kind of architecture that you know have given countries and regions around the world identity right? That's architecture for you. It's been around for a very, very long time. It's been a codified body of knowledge and therefore a discipline for a very long time. What are the top maybe two or three or four famous architects that come to mind? Some of you might even know that there are actually architects who are famous. It gets slightly easier with fashion because it's more of a consumer subject, tends to be. So if I ask you, please name some very famous fashion designers. Um, most of you, even though if you, you may not be students of fashion design, it's quite likely that you will know fashion designers. Yes, and some of you are mentioning Laurie Baker, B.V. Doshi, Hafiz Contractors. Yes, many of you know famous architects, Gaudi, right? You, many of you know famous painters, but how many of you, and this is the question, know famous interaction designers? Do any of you know famous interaction designers? Charles Goya, yes, sure. But interaction designers, now we are asking for interaction designers. Do you know any famous interaction designer? Okay. I take it no. And the reason for that is the fact that this field did not exist 15 years ago. You actually do not have anyone who says, I am a UX designer with 15 years experience. That person doesn't exist. That person doesn't exist, right? You will have engineers who will, you will have software people, you will have software engineers, developers, et cetera, who were trying to subconsciously follow something, but interaction design as a codified subject did not exist 20 years ago. Because one of the problems, of course, Don Norman, he's one of the pioneers of the field, um, Ketashri, but uh, before that, no one, right? So if you look at physics as a subject, and if someone comes to you and say, you know what, I know everything about physics. It's not possible. It's just not possible. It's a very old discipline. You have quantum physics, you have mechanical physics, you have all those kind of, you know, branches and streams and sub-disciplines and all of that, right? That it's impossible for one person to know. It's probably about maybe 60,000 hours worth of study. But interaction design is not like that. Interaction design is a relatively new field. It's a relatively young field. So if there are, let's say, two lakh architects in India, and I don't know what the number is. I'm sure someone knows what the number is on the call itself. But if there are two lakh architects in India, there's only maybe about 10,000 interaction designers in India, not even that. So the universe is very small because it's actually a very young discipline. There aren't a lot of universities or institutes that used to teach interaction design 10 years ago because the kind of problem that I outlined, how, what kind of designer would you actually call to solve the problem on your website of selecting or on your mobile app of selecting which doctor is there? That kind of a problem didn't even exist 20 years ago. So there's a very specific body of knowledge that interaction designers need to have. Interaction designers can take the form of a product slash communication designer, a UI UX designer, 
a UI designer, a UX designer, and I'll come to that part in a bit. But these are new problems of the new world. These problems did not exist earlier, right? Which is why you don't have any famous interaction designer because there is no one in interaction design who has been practicing for 25 years. There isn't anyone in India, right? So that's one difference. The field is fairly new, it's fairly shallow, but it's booming exponentially, exponentially. The whole course at Anantyu is designed in a way that it takes care of what the industry found lacking. I have been interviewing people from the top institutes in India, whoever had some sort of user experience design or interaction design course. And there are some things that I used to always find amiss. And with our cow course at Anant University, that's exactly what we are trying to address, right? Let's move on. Have you ever bought something that you needed an instruction manual for? Of course you have, right? Instruction manuals should be banned. If products were designed well, if they were human-centered design, you wouldn't need an instruction manual for anything. Bad experiences are all around us. Think of booking a train ticket on ircTC.co.in. How many of you have ever booked a train ticket on IRCTC. Have you ever booked a train ticket on IRCTC? Right? What is it that you need to deal with there? You need to deal with knowing the difference between 2A and CC and 3A and SL. You also need to know what is tatkal and premium tatkal and ladies quota and general quota. You also need to know the station codes. So if you want to come and visit me one day, which I hope you do, and I live in Goa, you can't just type Goa. Goa is not even a station code. If you type Goa, it is actually the station code for a place called Gohad Road in Madhya Pradesh. So rather than coming on the bright sunny beaches of Goa, you will end up reaching the center of the country. Right? So is that a great booking experience or would you rather book on clear trip for instance or make my trip right because they don't throw uh, so much jargon at you think of even if you haven't even if you imagine that you're booking an airline ticket on air india's website versus you're booking on an indigo's website you kind of already know where the experience is going to be better so there's bad experiences all around us think about the income tax filing website think about the website where people go to pay their taxes. The country is trying to expand their tax net. If it was much simpler, if it was just easy, and if people didn't feel intimidated, oh my God, I need to hire a CA for this, the country will collect so much more tax. So this realization that design actually helps companies and governments increase you know, productivity and add to their bottom lines, serve more people um, is, fairly recent. When I say recent, it's not more than 10-15 years old. Right? Let me move on further. Hopefully I'm making sense. If I'm not, please type something so that I know. So for every bad experience, every good experience, we have a uh, hundred examples of bad experience. The world needs more designers. So technology should be really as simple as, uh, and because you're based in Ahmedabad, I thought let's you know use a thepla. It should really be as simple as eating a thepla, using technology. And what I mean by this is the following. The way I see design, uh, including interaction design, is imagine that you have some things that come very naturally to you. So if you have a door, you know, a door that you actually push and open. Um, where should the door handle be? Naturally, it exists at a place where you make a 90 degree angle, the average heighted person will make a 90 degree angle with their elbow and just push. That will be the law of least effort at work. It's just simple. We don't think about it, but it's designed. If we put the door handle right at the bottom of the door 
or right at the top of the door, it wouldn't be good design. Not necessarily, I'll come to that. But it wouldn't be because elderly people may not be able to use it. Very young children may not be able to use it. It may not be that easy to use. You might expend more energy in doing the same task. It's come so simple to us that, you know, the door handle should be like this. We take it for granted. What about, and that's ergonomics, right? That's human factors, that's ergonomics. What about on-screen ergonomics? How do you, you know, pinching on screens and tapping things on the phone and clicking on things, it's not natural human behavior. It's not. So what kind of company or what kind of a designer needs to specialize in making sure that using whatever you're using on a screen or as a voice-based interface or as a gesture-based interface is really as natural to human beings and as intuitive as opening that door. That's really what interaction design is. Uh, at the very core of it, uh, with new and new products coming up, you will obviously have expanded definitions of it and we'll go to some definitions in a bit. The world is changing and uh, some examples. This is my daughter, by the way. She uh, is three years old. She knows how to say, okay, Google. She knows how to invoke Alexa. And she says, play Ringa Ringa. And this is not the world that I grew up in. Um, I remember getting my first PC when I was in school. Um, and I'll have to explain to my daughter that you were not born. I mean, you were born, you were not downloaded, right? We are designing for a very different world. Most of the jobs that will exist in 20 years from now have not even been invented yet. Do you think my parents have any clue of what I do or what is interaction design? If I said I was the, I'm an architect, they'll all know what I mean. If I'm an interior designer, they'll know what I mean. But if I dare I say I'm an interaction designer, um, it doesn't even, it's so new. Right? On the flight, very recently, I was sitting next to Manish Malhotra going back to Goa. And uh, he asked me, what do you do? I said, I'm a designer. He said, oh, what do you design? And there was a half an hour, very interesting conversation. Right? Interaction designers are mainstream designers. In fact, they will be in the majority uh, in a few years from now. Technology improves. People don't, and they get emotional too. So let me give you a very brief concept. So there is this concept called Alone Together. An MIT professor actually researched on it. Uh, he wrote a paper saying, we all live in hyper-connected communities. We are connected to everyone, but yet we are alone. What that means is that we have effectively traded off deep bonds and friendships for companionship. We actually use WhatsApp at the drop of a hat without thinking. Uh, but that deep bond with people, like for instance, if we were having a face-to-face in-classroom session and we were in a physical space, I'm sure that we'd be sipping coffee, we'd be standing outside of the corridor, there would be conversations, there'd be people gathering around, you could see my body language, I could see yours and all of that. It just creates some sort of an impression. What happens if you get technology to do that? What happens if you entirely rely on some sort of technology to do that, right? So alone together basically means we are very, very connected, yet we are alone. And this thing is only going to get worse and worse and worse. Okay, I had asked a question somewhere. Um, which is, can you be a better designer in 20 minutes? What do you think? Can you be a better designer in 20 minutes? I want some answers here. Can you type something in the chat? Do you really think it's possible to be a better designer in 20 minutes? Two people have said yes. I don't think so. Yes, I don't think so. It's possible. No, maybe. Yes. Okay, good. Good. They're more believers than they're not. No, okay, all right, depends on the situation. Very politically correct answer. Okay, excellent. All right, let me just give you my two cents on it. 
the good thing about design is that I can be, I can have my perspective, you can have yours, both can be very different and both of us can be right, right? That's the beauty of design. It's, 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 not, it's not particle physics. Um, if I ask you, what is your favorite mobile app, right? And I'm asking you, what's your mobile, favorite mobile app? Can you again just type something out so that I can see what's, what's majority and we'll take that up as a case? What's your favorite mobile app? Instagram, Pinterest, Instagram, Reddit, Instagram, Spotify, Tide, Netflix, Insta, Pinterest, Insta. Okay, okay, okay. Great. And, okay, let's stop that. Now, got it. So if in case most people think that, you know, Insta or Netflix or, you know, Reddit or whatever most people ended up writing uh, is the best app that they know. Um, also hear very frequently Swiggy and Book My Show, not anymore though, um, you know, Amazon, Google Pay, because it kind of rewards you and all of that. If I basically say to most people, even including design practitioners that, you know, what is it that you like about the app? You know, why don't you give me a design critique of the app? The kind of answers that I get, the kind of answers that I get is that, you know, it's very simple. It's very, the layouting is very good. It's very easy to use and all of that. Um, versus if I was to ask my mother to give me a critique of Instagram uh, or, you know, Amazon or Swiggy, she would say exactly the same things. It's very easy to use. It's very simple. It doesn't take a lot of learning, etc. But there is a big difference between being a design professional and being someone who thinks they can talk a little bit of design. Uh, I think, um, you know, st the students who are currently attending from the current interaction design uh, batch already know what I'm talking about. We've spoken about this before, but you need to have the vocabulary for it as well, right? If you were to go to a doctor saying that, you know, I have a, I have a pain in my stomach, you know, can you check? And he checks and basically his diagnosis is, mm, I think something's wrong. Would you be satisfied with that answer? I don't think so. You would need some term for that. You need to know what exactly happened and what are you suffering so that you can Google it and actually, you know, figure out what's going on and whether the medicine that he's given you is right or not. That's people of today. So how is it that you can look at any design, any design, it doesn't have to be just, you know, websites and mobile apps, it can be absolutely any design and decide whether if it is good or not, or at least form an educated view on that. And I'll just share with you Don Norman's way of looking at design. This is how he looks at. You may not be able to design better in these 10 minutes after you understand this, but you certainly will have a slightly improved sense of design appreciation or critique. The first thing is, how does it look? Visceral design. If I am designing the website of a university, versus I'm designing the website for a water villa in Maldives. Yeah. Which one do you think will look better? Or if I'm designing, you know, for a two-seater BMW sports car, which one would you think will look better? Of course, it's the latter subjects, not the insurance company or the university. It takes very little design sense for that because the subject itself is beautiful. So visceral design means that without thinking, do you like it or not? That's it. That's visceral design. Most people don't have to think about it. You can, you know, if, if I give you Times of India newspaper and if I give you Live Mint, you can look at both of them and say, okay, I like one or the other. It's just that visceral design. The second one is behavioral design of how you actually, you know, how does it work? Does it work the way you want it to work? was finding anything easy. So if I ask any of you, hey, you know, I feel like having a pizza. And we'll come to pizzas later. But I feel like having pizza with a mushroom topping on it. So can you order a pizza for me? And even if you haven't gone to, let's say, 
the website of a Domino's in the past, you still will be able to figure out fairly easily and be able to order something, right? It's good behavioral design. Everything is where you expect it to be. The, the shopping cart is on the top right and everything seems to work. Right? Uh, if I was to ask you the same thing about uh, IRCTC and book me a ticket, that's not good behavioral design. It's just not, you know, if you type Goa expecting that you'll end up in Goa, you'll end up in Madhya Pradesh. They work on the assumption that you already know a lot of these abbreviations, right? So that's behavioral design. How does it work? How does it feel? Is everything intuitive or not? And reflective is what else? Does it do anything else? Does it help you out in any other way? Does it make you feel that you want to come back to it? So if you've ordered one thing on Amazon or Swiggy, you've saved your credit card, you've saved your address, you've saved your delivery preferences, you will come back to it immediately. But if you go back to IRCTC or Air India website or income tax filing website, they'll try to get you to do a lot of the things all over again. It doesn't feel easier the more you use it. It's nearly as complicated, right? So if you look at anything, if you look at uh, your favorite app, if you look at the website where you had trouble the last time, if you look at something more complex, think Microsoft Excel. Microsoft Excel has more than 400 features, but most people use only five. If as an interaction designer, my brief to you was that I want MS Excel Lite, a different version of MS Excel that currently does not exist but I want to create it for people who are not finance wizards. They are not quant analysts. These are just normal people, but rather than using five functions, we want them to use 20 functions. It shouldn't be as intimidating. So we want to create an Excel light with improved interactions, fewer features, but better discoverability of what those features do without making it very scary. That's a beautiful brief for an interaction design. That's not something that other design disciplines can do. It's not something that software designers can do because human beings. So imagine that there is an industry that deals with hardware. There's an industry that deals with hard disks and monitors and all of that processors. There's an industry that specializes in making software, but interaction design is the discipline that helps bridge the gap between that hardware software and the human being. Because like I said, pitch, you know, pinching screens and tapping on screens doesn't come naturally to us. It doesn't. So, what kind of things do interaction designers talk about? They say, you know, if this is the cell phone, there are many people who use the cell phones like this, but as the screens started getting bigger, started, people started using things like this. Many people use screens like this, right, with two hands. So where should most of your controls be? At the bottom of the screen so that your frequently performed actions are easier to reach. The things that are not easier to reach are the things that you don't want to do, them to do repeatedly. It needs to be at the top of the screen. What are the other kind of insights that I need to use as an interaction designer? Right. I need to think about things like decision fatigue. How many times are you asking me to design something or to decide on something? If I was to tell you what comes after A, everyone knows it's B. If I tell you what comes before L, most of you know it, but you'll have to think. In designer parlance, you'd call it cognitive load. In most of the products that we use, there is a high degree of cognitive load because it is designed by people who make software, who make hardware, but they aren't really thinking in a very human-centered way. We actually simplify a lot of the things that work, therefore making it delightful and even more useful. Hopefully this is making sense. I'll go into something a little bit more jovial because I don't think that I've been true to the title of the webinar so far. We live in a world of similar companies employing similar people, coming up with similar ideas, producing similar things at similar prices and similar quality. Right? How do you differentiate? How do you differentiate in this world? Right? Whatever I can do, anyone else can as also. So let me quickly talk about what is it that companies are doing to win your trust? Right? This is a watch company. There's another watch company that says that born in, on an island near Geneva, Lake Geneva in 1789 and still there. 
that's their line this company says you you don't own our watch you merely preserve it for the next generation how beautiful right rolls royce at 60 miles an hour the loudest sound comes from your electric clock how beautiful is that they're trying to say that our car is very silent so what is it that the company is trying to do it is trying to creatively communicate with you that's what's called advertising it should be truth well told that's all what advertising is if you were to go to a salesperson if you were to go to a department store retail store um, anywhere then you will be able to see the body language of the person there will be some emotion involved there will be some persuasion sir lady ji madam please you know this is this is good for you or whatever it is let me just come to what companies do to try and sell to you want to try and you know, win your trust effectively what a brand is is what people say about you when you're not in the room now everyone is quickly thinking okay if i was not here what is my friends thinking about me right you can you, you can think like that but that is exactly what a brand is uh, I'll tell you a very quick story. Um, just trying to do a quick time check. Okay, we still have some time. Uh, in fact, we don't have time based on the kind of content I have. I'll skip this. Sorry, guys. Irrelevant slide for now. Uh, this is the first version of the websites that we know as Flipkart, that we know as Uber. that we know as Airbnb, all multi-billion dollar businesses now, of course, unicorns. Right, how companies build brands and how is this relevant to what we're talking about in interaction design? A part of it is communication because you already want to use a product regardless of how it is designed based on the perception that the company has created for you, right? I'm going to skip that in the interest of time only. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. This was relevant, but I'm going to move on to things that are a little bit more consequential. Right, let me talk about how to impulse people. Like if, if you are buying something online or if you are filling out a form online or something like that, it's between you and your device. You could be doing while lying down in bed. You could be doing while traveling in a train. You could be doing that while you're in your class, secretly texting below your desk whatever it is, but what happens when you meet people? So there is a theory called GIFTS, G-I-F-T-S, which is used to persuade you, which is caused to impulse you. And I'll give you my favorite examples. Um, so the first is greed. Who here on the webinar thinks that they are a greedy person? Does anyone think they're greedy? I do. Okay, great. <laughs> Sanjana. So what it basically means is I would like to pay for an economy class seat, but I would like to fly business class. I would like to get a master's degree, but I don't want to study for two full years. I'd rather study for one year. I would like to get a bachelor's degree in two years and still have the same equivalency of three years. So that's nothing but greed. Greed means that you want to do little, but you want to get more. I think that's a basic human emotion. Everyone has that. The greed could be saving money. It could be learning more. But basically what it means is that what you put in and what you get are disproportionate. You should put in little and get a lot. That's natural. The second is indifference. Now think about it this way. Um, if I, would I rather do a master's degree from the university that rejects the most amount of students or to the one who actually advertises on bus shelters? I suppose the answer is to the university that, that rejects the most amount of students. That's how they create the exclusivity. They don't lose indifference. They don't care if you apply or not. That's the image that they give. They are not coming across as they really need you, but you need them. That's the impression that they give you. So indifference, right? 
fear of loss. I'll give you an example, a very real example I've given to the students who are currently in the interaction design batch entering semester five. Um, so I used to live in London for a while and I went to this store called Gucci. They were selling suits, men's suits, and it had a big board there called closing down sale, all stock must go. All suits, 80 pounds only. And I thought, wow, that's a wonderful deal. 80 pounds and you get a Gucci suit. I bought two of them. And the next day I wore it, I went to work and my colleagues all um, smiled at me and said, oh, that's a Gucci. I said, yes. And I was feeling quite chuffed about it. And they said, you know what? That store has been there for the last three years. In fact, they're so successful, they've opened another one down the road, also calling it closing down sale, all stock must go. That's when I realized the power of fear of loss. I only bought because I thought I wouldn't get the chance to buy it again. Offer valid till stock last, first hundred colors only. This is all fear of loss. This is all something that is possible when you're in front of people, very easy to kind of persuade you. How do we do that interaction design, right? The Jones theory, I will do what Mr. Jones did or what Guptaji did or what my neighbors did or what my family did. So I'm perfectly happy with the way my house looks. But now suddenly my neighbor did up their house, they painted their walls, they have a nice entrance, they are, have a good shoe rack outside and all that. And now mine looks shabby, so I need to do that too. That's the Jones theory. And the last one is similarity, which is people will buy from people who are very similar to them which means that if someone is talking fast, I also talk fast. If someone is talking slow, I try to mirror their body language. I also try to have a sense of urgency. S also stands for sense of urgency. If you go to see a flat for rent, no one is going to People are going to say, hey, you know what? Someone actually saw it. They might just put down a deposit. Uh, if you want it, you better design fast. So these are some of the very regular impulses that are very easy to project when you're in a physical face-to-face -face environment because we can read body language. If I want to be indifferent, if I want to say, hey, I don't really care if you buy it or not, I can just shrug my shoulders, hey, you know, it's up to you. But what do I do where the only thing that you, I'm interacting with you is a screen? If I'm selling insurance, people used to sell insurance very hard. It's a sell product. It's not a buy product. People really have to push for it, even credit cards for that matter. So how do I persuade people if in case I don't even have an opportunity to meet them? What kind of a designer would be required in that case? So this is the theory of impulses. Moving on, designers can make a way to people's hearts and minds and sometimes wallets. Yeah, I'm going to skip the slide in the interest of time, but you can read what's on the screen if you'd like. Now I'll give you some specific examples of interaction design. So here's an example of an app called Burp. Burp is a discovery platform. They are in the same space that Somato exists. Their brief to my company was a new company called Zomato with the red logo has just emerged. It's a winner takes it all market. And they're running with, away with all the market share. We have a bigger database than them. We have all kinds of capabilities, but we don't have the same kind of advertising money. So we want to compete with them, but we want to compete based on product differentiation. We don't want to compete based on spending advertising money. What is it that we can do? So this was their app when they came to us. There's nothing wrong in it. After the redesign, the research, the UX research, the reskinning exercise, the interaction design, this is what came out. Same app. If you see on the left, there's a dial-based interaction. The top of the dial is still where your thumb will reach. It's a black screen because it saves battery. The insight was that people don't crave restaurants. They crave food. So if I want to have a fantastic 
I don't know. Dabeli, it's Gujarati, right? I mean, although my surname is Modi, I'm not Gujarati, so I'm not related to Lalit Bhai or Nirav Bhai or Narendra Uncle. You know, uh, I happen to be from Rajasthan. So coming back to this, um, if I want to have a great Dabeli, it will show me a visual grid. And if I click on that item, it will show me the nearest is 500 meters from you. The best in Ahmedabad is 17 kilometers from you. Click the navigate. So you can either have the best of or the fastest of. You can decide. And let's say if you're a vegetarian like I am, you basically swipe out the dishes that you don't like. After seven or eight such swipes on the right screen, the Apple sends you over a vegetarian. You don't like what you see, you can just shake and the screen will rearrange. So if you see what the app was, what the app became, it is purely a function of interaction design. What is the micro interaction? If you want to select the state that you live in, you could actually type G-U-J and Gujarat drops down. It's a progressive form. You could also show the map of India and you can therefore ask people to click on the state that they live in. That could also be an option depending on what device it is. Cumbersome on a mobile phone, but somewhere it's a very large touch screen, maybe good. It could also be that you're trying to create a gamified experience. It could also be a simple drop-down box. So those are all micro interactions. The board micro interactions were popularized a lot when Bill Gates accidentally said somewhere that you know the three finger salute that you know, that control, alter, delete is one of the worst micro interactions that you design. So tapping, scrolling, Pinching, zooming out, these are all micro interactions. So we chose micro interactions here. This is the Burp application. One example of what interaction design is. I showed you an example on mobile. Let me show you a quick example on desktop. Right. This is the website for HI banking, high net worth individuals for Kotak Bank. Their brief to us was that we want. Um, a mobile friendly site, this is not mobile friendly, but we, when we look at the site, we said that, you know what, every piece of communication has an information carrying capacity. Imagine if I was to meet you and if I give you my business card and on my business card, I have the list of every single client that I've ever worked with. Would that be an overkill? I think so. It should have my name, my job title, company address, email address, phone number, etc. It shouldn't have my client list. That's not the right medium to tell you my client list on my visiting card. But we said you've exactly done that. You have actually over given people information because what is the purpose of the home page of any website? We think it's acquisition of new clients. Acquisition of new clients. We think it is communicating what your brand stands for. So if you think of select magazine, or Uday speaks, or feedback, or profile, financial milestones. We told Kotak Bank that we think the only people who ever click on it are the people who are made responsible for uploading this information on a monthly basis. Real customers never click on things like this. So the new website uh, changed into something like this that tell us if you're a customer or if you're not. If they say that I'm not, and this is a cookie based approach, so you don't get to see the screen again on the same device. Then we emulate the experience of walking inside a plush branch. It says only one thing on the page, right? When someone is filling out a form, I'm telling them on the left, never fill out a form again. Again, what was the experience to what is the experience? There are two kinds of people involved in this kind of project. One person is logically very creative, logically. They don't know how to use Photoshop. They don't know how to do design. They can sketch, they can think, right? They can research. And the other kind of people, they are good at visual usability, white space, negative space, page balancing, and those kind of things. The one last example, we are nearly towards the end of the presentation. The one last example I'll show you is Pizza Hut. I said that, you know, why is the best interaction designer that I know for the last six years younger than 30 years old? That's simply because I don't know people who have been interaction designers for 20 years. It's a young discipline. 
it's a fairly shallow discipline. So if you study well, and if you practice for a few years, if you read the five best books in interaction design, you honestly speaking in the 85, 85th percentile of interaction designers in this country automatically. So now let's take this very beautiful example, Pizza Hut. Uh, most people, if I ask them who is Pizza Hut's competition, they say Domino's. Very far from the truth, it's not Domino's. It's, you know, people who are in Ahmedabad or people who are in wherever, they you know, used to know pizza as celebration food. Friends used to come home, party, something, whatever, they can order something. You know, 10 years ago, it was only pizza. Now, people are saying, the wasabi is not pungent enough. When I order my sushi, it's not pungent enough. So it's a changing consumer preferences. Pref consumers know much more. But the second thing is that you're not competing with Domino's. Domino's is mainly a delivery business. They may have the odd restaurant or two, but that's because they couldn't find any better real estate. Pizza Hut, on the other hand, is a serious restaurant business. They do also deliver a little bit, right? So who's their competition? It's the aggregators like Swiggy and Uber Eats and Zomato and Food Panda, those kind of people. So when we said that, you know, people go to a restaurant, what kind of people are there? Let's look at personas. One is the kind of persona who says, I will look at the menu and only then decide what I want to eat. Otherwise, I can't decide. So there should be a way for me to browse the menu. So if you see on the top right of the screen, it says start your order. That's a UX writing research term. We didn't say browse menu, view menu. We said start your order. That takes you to seeing the menu. There's another person like me who will only go if there's something really, really different about it. So if you tell me there's a Pani Puri pizza, there's Pani Puri topping on it, I'll go because it sounds very adventurous. I won't go otherwise. There's value hunters who say, I'll go on a Wednesday only. It's buy one, get one free. Otherwise, I won't go. How can I appeal to all these guys on the homepage itself? So we actually did a little bit of study. We were trying to see this. If you see, there's a device right at the bottom of the screen. That's gaze mapping. I'm trying to see people's eyeball movements across the page. This is UX research. I'm trying to see whether if people will react better to a slice of a pizza, or if I put a full circle of a pizza, or a pizza inside a box. What happens if I change the font? What happens if I call the action button customize rather than add to cart as it currently is? So I was trying to design the most intuitive, the most simple website there could be by doing not only click analysis, but also visual gaze analysis. Also reading their facial expressions. So if I smile, I already know that I'm in a good mood and the camera can see that. So this website is now the best practice template in about 16 countries across the world in emerging countries for Pizza Hut. Moving on, if you see any product, at a basic level, they need to be functional you should be able to order something, place an order. Second, it needs to be reliable. Whenever you need it, it should be available. The third is it needs to be usable, that it should not take a lot of learning or getting used to, but the competition is not in any of those places now. The competition is only in the place that, is it pleasurable or not? Do I enjoy using it or not, right? We talk about the terms millennials a lot, the people who are basically born after 1983. There's various definitions. I think it's after 1983. Uh, so, you know, they have a slightly different way of thinking. They didn't grow up, you know, thinking of finance with Kisan, Vikas, Patra, and post office savings scheme. They're thinking SIP. They're thinking a sachet economy. They didn't grow up practicing DOS on a computer. They grew up with cell phones, right? They're probably never likely to visit a bank branch. They're very different people. So is the experience pleasurable or not? That's where the competition is. That's what the nirvana of design really is for interaction designer. Is it a great fun experience? Now, what are the new things that are happening in this field? Oops, sorry, sorry, again. So there is a lot of uh, new stuff happening in terms of new kind of screens. There will be screens which will be foldable. There are devices like, you know, audio devices, 
you know, haptic feedback devices, beacons, Bluetooth, Zigbee, right? Okay, Google and Amazon and Alexa and all of that has already been around for a while now, but there's a lot happening in this industry. What are the roles that you can get hired for once you do a course like this? You could be an interface designer. You could be a visual designer. The interface and the visual designer is more right brain. They are more visually creative people. They worry more about aesthetics. Does it look pretty? Does it look nice? Does it behave well, right? The other set of people, interaction designers, digital strategists, UX researchers, they are more left brain. They are more logically creative. They may not be great designers. They may not be great graphic designers. They may not be good artists. But they are people who can design systems really well. And the more experienced roles are people who are design managers, heads, chief design officers, and so on and so forth. An increasing number of people are hiring chief design officers these days. Then there's another conundrum. Should you work for an agency, which is in my company, when the ministry said you will have to keep the middle aisle and aircrafts free, and people will have to wear that plastic visor sort of thing, how can airlines actually include that in their buying process on the website when people buy tickets? They do that in the morning, in the afternoon, they're working on some risk management dashboard for ICICI Bank, or what happens if people don't pay their credit card dues even after the loan moratorium is over versus someone who's working at amazon equally exciting however very different kind of people because amazon looked roughly the same even 10 years ago they will use a lot on user data research and all that and keep on making small little incremental changes whether if you work want to work for a small company whether you want to work for a very large company there are many, many, many different considerations, but these are the, roughly the profiles that are available right now. And I believe that most of the profiles that are required for interaction design, they don't even exist right now. The kind of video that you just saw, the kind of interfaces that requires a very close coordination with engineering, those are the mostly the left brain, brain people. They may not be able to design anything on Corel Draw or Photoshop, but these are people who are great interaction designers nonetheless. If you have any questions, um, which I may not be able to take up during this webinar, and we will take a few questions now. You should email this email address that is flashed on your screen, academicaffairs at anu.edu.in. But I hope so far, whatever I have said has made some sense. It has given you some sort of an inclination towards exploring interaction design at least. Anantyu has a great discipline uh, of interaction design. It's a very, very, very high in demand discipline, which means that naturally, uh, the kind of faculty that you have as well, most of them are practitioners, right? People who actually are doing live industry projects more than academics, because the academics here are fewer. And we have someone called Avi Ganguly who's joined us very recently, fantastic person. You should actually reach out to Avi as well if you have any detailed questions, but I'll attempt to take a few questions now. I see that there is eight questions. So, I'll try to see some of them. Information navigation modality content are responsible for building good interaction design. What is your opinion? Would you like to answer this question live? Okay, I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, this is a question by Naveen Kumar was asked right at the beginning. And I think that yes, they are. I think this question that you're asking is very applicable mainly in the field of uh, UI UX sort of interaction design, but I feel that if you're designing things like a, you know, Kinect sensor, or if you're designing something which is to do with beacons, or if you're designing something that is haptic feedback or shoes that actually talk to your phone and things like that, it may not have navigation really. Um, we are these days designing for glanceability, which means that I don't, I mean, I want, I want my attention span is so short. If I'm actually designing something on a smartphone a smartwatch, a wearable. It needs to be just glance and that's it. It may not have a screen at all. There would be very little navigation there. So I don't exactly understand the context of your question, Naveen. I hope I will be able to answer you separately. If in case you want to reach out to my email address is tanmay.modi at anu.edu.in. You're welcome to reach out to me so that I can understand your question better. Um, I have the same question, but regarding communication design. Hmm. That's uh, Koninika Datta Gupta. Again, I don't know which same question you're talking about. Uh, I'll skip this for now. Do people become lazy if we make it easy for them? Yes, absolutely, they do. 
Absolutely, they do. One, then this is very, very debatable because one might argue that we are actually freeing up tasks that can be very easily automated, therefore freeing up more time for us to do things that matter even more and be more human and spend more time with family and all that. But is that really happening? And I'm not the one to decide for that, but you can take a decision yourself. Everyone has a different perspective. Five years ago, it was very difficult to imagine that if you just think about, you know, any lunch, you don't even have to talk to a human being. You just have to tap on your screen a few times and it'll be at your doorstep. Very difficult to think about that. But now it's very possible. Have we got lazier? Yes, we have. Yes, we have. So this is a million dollar question. Whatever technology advances that we have are all aimed towards the law of least effort, which means that how is it that we can make people spend less and less and less energy and time and still get the same result, right? I hope that answers your question. Uh, what is a full stack interaction uh, designer in interaction design terms? It basically means this, Sudarshan, it basically means to me, someone who knows right from research methodologies of going out in the field, research methodologies of synthesizing data collected from secondary research, doing information architecture, doing wireframing, doing the UI for it, and also using some front-end technologies, maybe the newer ones, something like you know, Angular JS2 or even the plain vanilla HTML CSS, et cetera. But that for me will be a full stack interaction designer, more in the web design sense. I don't know what is a full stack interaction designer if you were to talk in terms of uh, a voice bot sense like a Google, there are principles of designing voice bots, right? If SBI bank has a voice bot versus Bank of Baroda has a voice bot, they both should not sound the same. They both should have different personalities. So how, what is the principle of designing voice bots? So I don't think that this discipline is old and deep enough to actually have a common definition, but that's my answer to you. Uh, UI UX stuff, there's a lot of domains. We have a, We have some of the best UI UX stuff. How do we design new system in the same domain? Also, I think animation plays an important role. It certainly does. It certainly, certainly does. But uh, I am not sure if I understand your correction correctly. Can this be applied to game design? So think about it this way. This is to the autonomous attendee. Yes, it can be. The guy who designed Pokemon Go, he said it took me 30 years of hard work to become an overnight sensation. It's great on interaction design. You know, Angry Birds, most of you have played it, Temple Run, games that constantly keep you very addicted. The next time you play it, Try to see what is the interaction pattern. Are they using more tap, tap, tap? Are they using anything else? They keep it extremely simple, very, very engaging. Interaction design certainly, certainly has, has a big role to play in game design. Uh, what are the skills that an interaction designer needs to work efficiently? Long answer, I'm gonna skip it just in the interest of time. Recently watching a series name. Okay, I think that, you know, for the sake of time, now we are at 6.34. This was meant to end at 6.30. We are four minutes over time. I'm going to not take any more questions, but if you have any more questions about an unused discipline or how is it that you can actually, you know, take up interaction design as a career, please write to academic affairs at interaction uh, at anand.edu.in. Thank you everyone for your participation. It was lovely to meet you and uh, I hope you have a fantastic evening. Thank you very much.